Just before John presents the lesson this morning, we're going to be reading from the uh, book of Romans, if you'd like to follow along. The first chapter of Romans, and I'm going to be reading from verse 8 to the end of the chapter. That's Romans 1, verses 8 to 17. I'd like to invite you to stand, please. In the uh, Pew Bibles, it'd be nice if we all knew if I said Romans, everybody turned to Romans like that. Instead of telling you what page it's on, it's on page 1125 in the Pew Bibles. 1125. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly. I make mention of you, always in my prayers, making request, if perhaps now at last by the will of God I may succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have prevented, been prevented so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Amen. Please be seated. In the book of Acts, chapter 7, Stephen, one of the deacons in the early church, is put to death, executed by stoning, because of his Christianity. And as a result, in conjunction with that, there arises a great persecution. And chapter 8 of the book of Acts says that those who had been scattered as a result of that persecution went everywhere preaching the word. That's surprising, in a way. Because if one of my friends, if one of my Christian brothers uh, was executed for preaching the word, I think I would be tempted to shut up. You know, I think I'd be a little mute. I, I'd be docile. I would be withdrawn. I'd be hesitant to proclaim the word. But what did they do? Well, they had to leave town. But everywhere they went, they went proclaiming the gospel message, preaching the word. Why were they so motivated to do that? In today's reading, the apostle Paul is eager to go to Rome and to proclaim the gospel message. He's looking to bear fruit there with the word of God. Why would the Apostle Paul be so willing and so eager to endure shipwreck, fastings, hardships, scourging? I mean, he was stoned and left for dead himself on one occasion. Why willing to go through all that struggle and hardship, and suffering to carry the gospel message to somebody else. Because that gospel message is special. It's a gift from God. It is vitally important to soul salvation. There's a treasure there. And I want to assert and assure and encourage this morning that we, each of us, ought to treasure that gospel in that same sort of a way. 
And so I want to encourage you to look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, verse 16 and 17, because here that divinely inspired apostle, Paul, he speaks of the gospel and he tells of its value and he relates in a very simple way some basic truths about the gospel message that communicate its importance, its vital necessity to us and its preciousness as a gift such that we ought never be ashamed of it, but instead we ought to accept that gospel message and treasure it and eagerly follow it and endorse it and incorporate it into our lives and share it with other folks. And so I want to look at really verse 16 and consider why that gospel is so very important to every one of us. And the first thing that stands out is because it is the power of God to save us. To save us from condemnation. I don't know if everybody understands that. I hope everybody in this room does. But folks need to understand that if they have sinned, they stand condemned. If you have sinned, you stand condemned. That sin that inequity, that transgression. Translation of that word means missing the target, missing the bullseye. Somewhere along the line, you've missed the target of what you're supposed to be about and the business you're supposed to be about in your life. You've missed the bullseye some way, anyway. And the nature of God is that bullseye. And being that child of God that you're supposed to be, that holy and innocent and, 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 and uh, God-likeness, if you've missed that, somewhere along the line, you stand condemned. Now, as David was saying earlier, it could be something that you've done in the past, some sin that you committed, or it could be a sin of omission, something you should have done but neglected to do. Somehow, some way, you've missed the bullseye. It, whatever, somehow, some way, your life is out of sync with God, out of sync with godliness, out of sync with God's spirit, and you've missed the mark. And scripture teaches us that sin and the wages of sin is death. So I maybe don't know everybody in this room real well, but I'm pretty sure you've missed the mark someplace, somewhere along the line. And so I want to assert, along with the gospel message, that you ought not expect to be okay with God unless you've been saved. That's the gospel message that they were willing to die for and suffer and endure uh, all those hardships. So don't expect, to be, don't expect to be okay with God unless you've been saved and don't expect to be saved by any other means because the gospel is the power of God for salvation. So don't expect to be saved by, okay, I understand I goofed up, you know, way back when, but I'm going to be good from now on. Hey, there's still a debt that needs to be paid. There's something that needs to be taken care of. And you don't pay for that by makeup exams and, and, you know, extra credit work sort of thing. It's not your accomplishments ever that will pay for your missing the mark even in the past. You won't be saved by some incredible effort or sacrifice. It's not taking some sojourn or some thousand-mile walk or picking up a hundred-pound wooden cross and carrying it across Europe or something like that. That's not how you get saved. You can't make a bargain with God and come up with some impressive deal. If I do this, will you let me into heaven? It doesn't work that way. In fact, what would you do that's so special that God really needs it and he needs to make that kind of a bargain? Come up with some story. Come up with some excuse about, you know, how you were so bad off when you were a kid and, you know, this real tearjerker that'll make everybody cry. Uh, that still doesn't pay the debt. The wages of sin is death. And I want to consider that the church, you know, as important as the church is, the church doesn't save. It's the gospel that saves. 
The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Now, the church needs to be involved in all kinds of good works and feeding the poor and maybe marriage counseling and ministering to youth groups and all that kind of stuff. But unless that church proclaims and teaches that gospel message, it doesn't save anybody. It's the gospel message that saves. And so, once again, Romans 1, verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. Folks, other ways don't work. They won't work. They don't have God's endorsement. They don't have God's power in them. So what means will God use to save people? Well, he's told us. And he's given it to us. And we ought to treasure it and follow it. It's the gospel message. I want to imagine that you've wandered off, right? You were there with God. You were on the right path. You were on the right course, but you straight away got off. I mean, that's sin. You got off into, you know, some prodigal stuff. Or maybe worse than that, maybe you got mad and you stomped off in anger. And now you find yourself off someplace. You've left your family, maybe, and and now you're down in Argentina someplace, and you find yourself penniless like that prodigal son, right? And, uh, but somehow you get a hold of your dad, and he sends you a ticket. Here's your plane ticket. You can come home, be at the airport at 9 o'clock in the morning, and you say, okay. And so you go and you sit in the bus station. It's not the way the father said, Right? And if you go about it a different way, it's not going to work. you got to do what the Holy Father says do, and that's the gospel message. God the Father has designated the way, the means. He's made his offer, and he has provided that means of salvation for us. That's the gospel message. We need to do it his way. He can get us home any way he wants, but he's told us how he intends to do it, and that's the gospel message. If any of us would be saved, if any human would be saved from condemnation that they justly deserve, this is the means. This is the power of God for salvation. And not only that, but number two, it is God's means of salvation, the power of God for salvation for everyone. Now, sometimes folks think, There are other ways to get to heaven. You know, George is going to get to heaven this way, and and, uh, since since Sally is a different nationality and from a different country, uh, she'll get to heaven a different way. Folks, it doesn't work that way. You know, some folks will be saved one way, and, you know, they'll be saved by this religion, and they'll be saved by this religion. Uh, You know, there, there are religions out there where... The woman gets to heaven depending on the man getting to heaven. Boy, I'm glad that doesn't hold true. That, that, that's a falsity. That's not part of the gospel message. But people see that and people urge that and people teach that and that's wrong. People do not get to heaven different ways. You know, maybe the rich get one way and the poor come to heaven another way. Maybe whites get to heaven one way and blacks get to heaven another way. Maybe the Polish get to heaven one way and the Chinese get another way. Catholics one way and Methodists another way. It doesn't work that way, folks. Maybe the Buddhists have their own way and the Hindus have their own way and the Muslims have another way. And the Holy Scripture, the Word of God says no. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of salvation for everyone. That's the way. This is it, the gospel, for the Jews first and also for the Gentiles. Back again to verse 16, it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Well, everybody knows who the Jews are, who are the Greeks? That's everybody else, two kinds of people in the world, the Jews and the non-Jews. The word Greeks here is ethnos, from which we get ethnics, right? So you got the Jews, and the salvation opportunity came to them first. Jesus was a Jew, 
But then it expands from the Jews and that particular ethnic group, but it expands to every other ethnic group. Some Bibles will translate it as Gentiles. Some will translate it as Greeks. But it's every ethnic group. They get to heaven by the gospel. You know what? If we get exploring into outer planetary space and we find some Martians or some, some folks on, on, on Jupiter or 17 light years over in another galaxy, fits them too. This is the power of salvation. This is the means for everyone. God is the creator of all of them. God is spelled out one way and it applies to everybody. You know, there are things that can be done in a variety of ways. You know, I look at my income taxes and, well, you can file jointly, you can file singly, right? And there, there are lots of different ways you can file. Getting to heaven, there's one way, and it is the gospel message. It is the power of God for salvation. But we ought to notice as well, it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Folks have got to believe. And we ought to mention here that to believe is to obey. It's the same word. It's exactly the same word in Bible language. Believe means you place your trust in something, and if you trust it, you do what it says. And so it goes hand in hand with this idea of the obedience of faith. Romans chapter 1, verse 5, Paul speaking about his role as an apostle, and he says, through whom, through Christ, we, apostles, have received grace and apostleship to bring about, what's his goal in his preaching? What's the apostle about? To bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles, among all the ethnic groups, for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. The goal of that gospel message is the obedience of faith. When you trust, you do. And so believe is biblically often translated as obey because it's the same word. Obedience is a natural response to hearing the message and placing your trust, your faith in God. And so the Gospel of John chapter 3 and verse 35 says, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. He who believes, there's that word, trust, faith, believe, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey. That's that exact same word. That's that believe, trust, faith. Believe and obey are exactly the same word. He who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You know, folks sometimes say, I'm a believer. I believe. But if they don't, Follow it up. If they're not obedient as a result of their faith, they don't really have faith. And so James says, I will show you my faith by my works. You want to know if I'm a believer? Look at what I do. I do what he says. I listen to the gospel and I'm obedient to it. That's important. This is why the gospel is so precious and vital and why the early Christians went everywhere and endured everything proclaiming the word because point number three for this morning, anybody not saved by the gospel is not saved. Ouch, I don't want to hear that. I'm sorry, it's truth. If you're not saved by the gospel, you are not saved. If they're not saved by the gospel, they are not saved. We need to understand that the normal status of people in the world is condemned because they've sinned somewhere along the line. That might not be our typical assumption. I mean, man, I haven't murdered anybody. I must be going to heaven. No, but you sinned somewhere along the line is what the, the scripture would say. We've all sinned sometime, somewhere. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Ouch. That's talking about me, too. That sounds like trouble, doesn't it? And then chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. Ouch. 
That sounds like trouble. How about John 3, 17? For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Look at that and examine that. That means that before Christ came to save the world, the world was lost. If the world wasn't lost, condemned, there was no need for Christ to come to save it. He didn't come to condemn it. He came to save it. It already stood condemned. Without Christ, the world stands condemned. And we need to recognize there simply are no other ways to be saved. If you're not saved by the gospel, you're not saved. There are no other spiritual paths. You don't get saved by belonging to the right church. You don't get saved by having the right friends or family or political influence or saying the right magic words. Acts 4.12, salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. That's Jesus Christ and his gospel. And circle that word must. It's important. You know, you're not going to stumble across another way to heaven, another option. You won't find your own way. You won't get there by some lucky accident. And Jesus is not pretending and he's not mistaken when he says, I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. And the early church believed that and understood that. And so they went everywhere enduring hardship and struggling to proclaim the gospel. So anybody you know who's not following, who's not holding to the gospel of Jesus Christ, stands lost according to the word of God. And they are in need of that precious gospel message. Now, I might not know everybody here well enough to say this, but I doubt that you would walk past somebody out on the road who is in desperate need of help. They're laying there dying or they're sick or they're flopping around and, and it's within your capacity to help them. I would suggest everybody in this room probably would reach out and try to help. And what we need to understand is that they are struggling and gasping for breath eternally because they're lost. And you have it within your ability, if you have some knowledge of that gospel message, to save their eternal soul, their everlasting life, because you have some of the basic essentials of the gospel message, which is the power of God for their salvation. So I want to close today with a simple gospel review and an overview, an encouragement and a reminder and just a refreshment to each of us, the simple gospel. First off, God came in the flesh. God dwelt amongst us to show how God wants us to live. Try a few scriptures here. You know, there's a variety of scriptures we could pick, but let's pick a few. John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And then you slide down to verse 14, and that word we're talking about, which is God, became flesh and dwelt amongst us. What are we talking about? We're talking about God incarnate. The word of God became flesh and blood. In other words, Jesus Christ. And then verse 17 of John chapter 1, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth. Ah, that's what I want. I don't want ignorance. I don't want lostness. I don't want lies. I don't want just law. I need that grace and I need that truth. They were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who's in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. <laughs> I like that. Right? Here's an explanation. Now I can see and understand the very nature of Almighty God and what it is he's looking for from me and how to attain that grace and forgiveness by looking at Jesus Christ. God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, died to pay the price for our debt, our sins. Try 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. The apostle says, 
For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that is the gospel message. In other words, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And we need to understand that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Romans 8 verse 1, there's no condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's part of that gospel message. In Christ Jesus entails trusting obedience. It entails compliance. It entails seeking to abide in the very name, the very character of Christ. And so I'm in Christ. And that comes, it involves being baptized and committing one's life to him as Lord of your life. Galatians 3, 26. All of you are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. That baptism, as a result of that faith, you're saved by your faith, for because you responded in baptism, that involves water immersion, symbolically dying to self, but more than just symbolically, it means being spiritually immersed in him and in his spirit and spiritually dying to self to live for him. I think Mark 16, 16 reinforces that same concept. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. Not talking about just simply getting wet, though in getting wet is involved in it because it is talking about a water immersion, but I mean been baptized, I mean be totally immersed in the concept of Christ. Inundated, overwhelmed, engulfed in who and what he is. And so, by my faith, I'm obedient to him in every way. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. How about 1 Peter 3.21? Baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, here baptism a part of the gospel, and a part of that gospel method, the God-ordained method of making that appeal to God for a clean conscience and calling on his name. Gospel includes not only that calling on his name and that response and that trusting, it involves a continuing trust. Colossians 1.22 says, Yet he has now reconciled you, that he's brought you back in the unity. He has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. That's what I want. I want to stand in the presence of God without any sin and be accepted into heaven. That's the gospel message. Verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you've heard and which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Gospel is not something you do and then walk away from. That response, that faith, that trust, that good news message, something you endorse and you follow with all your life. It's a new lifestyle. It's a being born again so that I'm new with a new orientation in my life. Folks, to get to heaven, one must submit to and live by the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, Help us to treasure this gift that you've given us, to totally endorse it with our lives, to belong to you, to abide in you, in Jesus Christ, and by the power of his sacrifice in his name. Amen. I hope that you are aware of any personal sins you may have. And that any sin separates you from heaven. 
And I want to urge you to accept God's grace and God's truth by endorsing the gospel, by being immersed, baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and by continuing to live faithful and true to that message. If there is some way that we in this congregation can help you, now is the time to return, to make that appeal, to submit your whole life to Almighty God in Christ Jesus by the power of His sacrifice and His Spirit. Amen.